In any event, uh, the Tannehills uh, make this point in the course of their ongoing defense of cooperative economic relationships, peaceful cooperation over, uh, in place of, uh, top-down, state-driven uh, economic relationships. They rightly emphasize that the state's impact on economic relations, uh, which it can't but mess up because it simply doesn't have the right information and it's driven by political considerations that involve awarding privileges and goodies uh, to uh, favored, uh, uh, well-connected constituencies. Uh, the state's impact, in any event, takes three forms, okay? Law and regulation, money and banking, and taxing and spending. And in all of these cases, distortion uh, is, uh, is a crucial uh, consequence. They rightly point out that spending by the state targets objectives politicians or politically favored constituencies want to support, not the things ordinary people actually want and are willing to pay for. If ordinary people actually wanted them and were willing to pay for them, guess what? They would actually, in fact, pay for them. Uh, the fact that the state does so is good evidence that uh, only uh, politically favored constituencies want uh, whatever it is that the state's paying for. So, the Tannehills are absolutely correct when, in the course of this discussion, they observe that the state makes and keeps people poor. I've mentioned this already. So licensing laws keep people from working in some jobs. Zoning laws keep people from working and living in the same places. Uh, building codes limit the kinds of housing people can have. And make no mistake, the practical effect of these kinds of regulations is very often to force people into homelessness and to keep people who are housed but poor in poorer conditions. Okay? People essentially have to choose between, on the one hand, the kind of housing that middle class planners think it's okay for them to have, or no housing at all. They don't get to make any other choice. Now, the beneficiaries of these kinds of regulations are middle class folk whose aesthetic preferences just don't jibe with those of poor folk, of businesses that don't want competition from poor people and so who want to raise the barriers to entry into their particular markets and so forth. Um, you know, the Tannehills are absolutely right that this is a crucial way, the imposition of these kinds of regulations is a crucial way in which the state makes and keeps people poor. But the Tannehills drop the ball, I think, when they talk about the England of the Industrial Revolution as if it were a free market. They talk about poverty in this context and say, in effect, well, but working in those dark satanic mills uh, that William Blake talked about uh, really was the best available alternative. What they don't recognize is that just as the state is involved in keeping people from working today and taking care of themselves today in ways that tend to make and keep people poor, the same thing was true in Industrial Revolution era England. Industrial Revolution era England was nothing like a free market. If your goal is to defend free markets, you simply don't have to do so. You shouldn't do so by defending Industrial Revolution era England. Why not? Because, in fact, the state, which acted here clearly on behalf of the uh, aristocrats and the well-connected business types who were the most important social players, uh, the state intervened to increase the availability of cheap labor to the uh, uh, most important uh, economic players and, at the same time, to transfer control over land that had previously been uh, owned by local communities into the hands of local aristocrats. Instead, think about the Enclosure Acts, about which I'm sure you've read. Uh, there's ongoing debate about just what effect these had, but the bottom line was that what had previously been common areas um, uh, owned by uh, local townships and, and so forth, where common grazing could occur, uh, instead, uh, these, uh, these common areas were enclosed, that is, were legally uh, delimited uh, and identified as the property of local aristocrats. Okay? The Enclosure Act denied ordinary people access to land that they and their ancestors had used for centuries, but this isn't the only thing that happened. There was also an internal passport system. It wasn't called that. It wasn't as rigorous and nasty as the internal passport system that obtained in Tsarist Russia, but there was, in effect, an internal passport system because there were rules that limited where people could look for work. You had to have special permission to work outside your local community, okay? And so if people couldn't move around for work, then they really did have to take whatever crappy jobs were available at the time. Um, so it's a little deceptive, I think, 
I'm not suggesting the Tannehills were being deliberately deceptive, but it's just inaccurate to talk about people as having no better alternatives than awful factory work when the lack of alternatives was a result of the choices of politicians influenced by the people who invested in and made money from the factories. Okay, Very straightforward point. Um, if you don't know about this, I invite you to go online and read the relevant uh, portions of Kevin Carson's Studies in Mutualist Political Economy. Uh, just Google Studies in Mutualist Political Economy and you'll find it. Um, what Carson does is to document ways in which English aristocrats and politicians and business leaders made absolutely clear this isn't some Marxist uh, speculation. This is exactly laid out in the words of the people themselves. They made clear that they did not want people to be able to loaf comfortably. Okay? They say in re repeated, uh, uh, context, repeatedly in different contexts, we think it's important that people be hungry, that they be able to feel the pressure of uh, lacking the resources that they need so that they will be willing to take the jobs we offer them. It's very clear this was the agenda uh, that lay behind many of the changes that occurred uh, during this period. It is not the case that simple, impersonal economic forces were at work with the result that, wow, the economy changed and now people suddenly are forced off the land and have to go take awful factory jobs. No, the reality is that the people with the most power used the power of the state to cause it to be the case that people were unable to uh, obtain alternate employment easily. Um, so the thing to recognize then is that this is not remotely like a free market because this is not a situation in which uh, voluntary cooperation is happening, people are engaging in free exchange. This is a situation in which the power of the state acting on behalf of the power elite and the power elite's uh, clients in the, the, you know, farther down the chain in the aristocracy and the business class, the state is engaged actively in limiting people's options uh, so that they're driven, they're corralled into work in a particular, uh, a particular sector and they're feeding uh, the uh, model of industrialization that the wealthy and well-connected wanted. So I object then to the Tannehill's reference to industrial revolution era England as if it were anything like a free market. But the basic point here is clearly right and I think could be made even more strongly if the Tannehill's recognized the political problems uh, with the industrial revolution. Now, similar political problems come into play where the money supply is concerned, and the Tannehills are very right to emphasize this as a context, again, in which uh, manipulation by the politically well-connected can make a huge difference. When the state controls the money supply, it can create inflationary booms in which people believe over the short term the economy is growing enormously that the real quantity of valuable goods and services in, is increasing. Because, of course, when, when there's money out there, there's money to spend, and this creates the impression that more valuable stuff, more valuable goods and services are out there, and so people spend away accordingly because they've been sent an inaccurate signal. Uh, the Tannehills offer, I think, the perfectly apt analogy. What happens if I come into your local community uh, with a huge stash of counterfeit money and I spread that uh, counterfeit money throughout your local economy. Now, obviously, over the short term, it's going to seem as if that economy is booming. Okay? It's going to seem as if, wow, there's all of this demand for new work. There's all of this demand for uh, uh, new, new goods, uh, new construction. It's a wonderful thing, but then it quickly becomes apparent that, in fact, the real value of the economy the fundamentals of the local economy are absolutely the same. And so there's been this, this boom period that's happened when over the short term uh, economic activity has taken off in response to this phony signal that's been sent by the presence of the counterfeit money in the economy. Then, not very surprisingly, there's going to be a, a bust after the boom because the reality is the fundamentals of the economy are no different. And so 